All right, gang, we got a real cool guest this week. You guys, if you've listened to my show, you know that whether or not we're talking sci-fi or if we are talking horror movies, what Star Wars 95% of the time wedges itself into the conversation. And this man right here is a director of one of my favorite Star Wars fan what it was to be a fan growing up when I saw the Phantom Menace opening night in uh, seventh grade. Uh, he capsulated that feeling so well with the movie Fanboys. And by God, as a producer, he is capsulating the feeling of what it was to watch the Star Wars holiday special for the first time. Finding it, the quest to find it. I love how you guys captured that finding it, reacting to it as to what exactly it was we just watched. But uh, Mr. Kyle Newman, director, author, producer, the latest thing is A Disturbance in the Force, a documentary telling just how the Star Wars holiday special happened. Thank you for joining me, man, and congratulations. Thank you for having me. That's a really nice intro. I appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm a lifelong Star Wars fan, so anytime I have the opportunity to talk about it or work on it, even if it's tangentially, uh, I'm in. You know, Fanboys was a labor of love and a dream project, and it took years to get made. I got involved in, you know, I heard about it first in 1998 when it wasn't even a period piece, and mm -hmm. it didn't come out till 2009. You know, and I didn't get involved till, you know, early 2000s. So it's it takes a while. And this documentary, again, we started during the pandemic, and it's three years in the making, and um, <clears throat> made it for no money um but with a lot of love and a lot of affinity for star wars and that history of early lucasfilm and sure. how it coincided with late 70s television and our goal was to really give context to um to the special because you can just look at the special and watch it on youtube or whatever and be like oh my god this is horrendous <laughs> but you have to understand that star wars didn't invent the bad format of variety television. It was merely plugged into it as a way for George to protect his investment and to keep Star Wars present in pop culture and in the zeitgeist and on television. So when he's spending all his money making Empire, uh, people would remember what Star Wars is. And yeah. unfortunately, this one backfired. So it's a really cool story to look at in a historical sense. And uh, thankfully, we got to interview all these legendary people that got to work, that worked on it. You know. Yeah. Um, so some of that stuff's the, the 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 big achievements for us, like tracking them all down and getting them all together, and really telling I think the definitive tale of the Star Wars holiday special. The thing that was cool, you just hit it on the head because I don't know if you've watched or had the time to watch Light and Magic on Disney Plus, which was like the documentary. Oh, yeah. So I watched it twice. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so this has that vibe. Because you found all those guys that worked on it, and then you like cut to Weird Al and Bruce Valanche and uh, you know some of the other comedians that are in it, and it's like, man, like what about this scene? And then all you know, reaction, reaction, reaction. But then you do have the people who made the special telling, like, okay, this is what we were actually trying to do. So it is like this really good balance of both sides of the coin that you guys put together. You understood what they were up against financially, creatively. The the special just kept getting longer, went from 30 minutes to an hour to two hours, you know, and then it's like, they're just trying to sell more ads. Um, I love, there's there's obviously we talked, you know, J.W. Rinsler is um, an amazing historian. It was great to get him in there. It's his last interview and he really grounds it and gives it some artistic context, but there's a guy in the middle of this doc and we're, you know, he's like, I was on set for 24 hours, you know, and then we watched it and we're like, that was it. You know, I could have done that in an hour or two. You know, it's really funny because they, these guys, you know, this is 40 something years ago and they still have these frank recollect recollections of being on set and working on it. And it's, a, it's a weird, almost forgotten element of star Wars history. It's a curio, but it's, it's still important and it hasn't died down. Here we are in 2023 and people are still talking about this special on the 45th anniversary when Lucasfilm and other people would have hoped it would have died by now. Why is this thing still around, you know? The cool thing that you guys, you know, kind of a spoiler, but the cool thing you guys do is you talk about how Life Day has made its way into the parks and, and being 
<clears throat> my dad and I, we were there on Life Day last year. And it's really, a, yeah, and it's a thing, man. And how it was is, it? Was it like, was everybody <clears throat> aware of it and partaking in it, or did was it feel like so? Like, like did Disney of, make a big thing out of it, like the comp, the company itself? Oh yeah, they they go they go pretty hard on Galaxy's Edge, and it, my dad had retired, so a bunch of us chipped in, and I took him to Star Cruiser on Life Day. Holy moly! And so this was like, I've never seen my, I mean, we could go on a whole different conversation about seeing him completely open up like that cast, like broad outsides of my dad I've never seen before. But one thing they did, one thing they did on the ship on Life Day too was like, they all were aware it was Life Day. And it was just like, Life Day is for children. Like, how dare you even wear red? Like, what are you doing? Like, the Imperials to us and stuff. And it was just like, it really was like this embrace, embraced of this celebration and finding Chewie, you know, happy Life Day, Chewie. Chewie's going crazy. It's just like, it was cool, man. Oh, that's that's really cool. Um, The film that you guys did, like, how, you said you guys started on the, on, during the pandemic. How long did it take you guys to track everybody down who worked on it? Because in the movie, too, there's some people that were saying, like, George, for the longest time, like, wants his name off of it. Doesn't even want it, like, associated with them type of a vibe. So how long did it take you guys to, like, compile the list that you guys got? Well, Jeremy Kuhn and Steve Kozak are the co-directors. And um, Jeremy's also our editor. And they approached it in a very serious way. There's a lot of research. They would just, you know, you'd hear about a name, look at a credit, you'd see if someone's around on Facebook, someone would recommend you to somebody else. You know, finding the whole family of dancers was a big thing. There's, they interviewed the two brothers that weren't, they didn't make it in the final cut, but there are also two brothers in the dance troupe mm. that all performed for, for Lumpy. So just that. And then you've got to, you know, you track down Bob Mackey and then, you know, getting like Steve Binder was a big thing who replaced David Akumba as the, he was the second director. And um, I think the first interview was Lenny Rips, um, who was one of the writers mm -hmm. and then building out from there and getting the writers. Cause they seemed to spend the time with Lucas and they could kind of steer you in directions in terms of story and, and um, veracity. Uh, there's there's a lot of myths out there about the special, like who did what, and some of these guys right. could be like, I didn't, I never wrote that. I don't know whose that is. Like the Star Wars Archives book, which came out a few years ago. It's a brilliant book by Paul Duncan, but I think they wrongly accredit um, one of the outlines to those writers, and they're like, we we don't even know what that is. Like, huh. um, and they have pretty good memories. They would they would own it. They'd be like, oh yeah, I wrote that. It was terrible. You know, they tell us what they wrote. They are like, we never touched that, and that's what really led us to believe that was a George Lucas you know, written thing, or at least dictated by George to his assistant who typed it up. And it feels very George Lucas. So you, it just kept opening more doors as you sat with someone and then, you know, adding the layer of celebrity to it. Like these, but not just random. These guys were all diehard Star Wars people. Weird Al had put like the Star Wars holiday special into one of his videos. Patton Oswalt, you know, is super knowledgeable about television history and, and sitcoms and variety shows and stuff. And he eats up this obscure stuff. He loves it. So sitting with him and then getting his perspective on it and Seth Green, you know, did his detour show and he got to work with George and that and robot chicken star Wars and stuff like that. So getting insights into people that, that collaborated with George, not just, not just because, Oh, they're funny. It was people that had a really unique perspective on it. Um, mm -hmm. Kevin Smith and um, you know, Taron Killam's a huge, huge star Wars fan. And so it's great to have this, this extra layer of celebrity kind of lampooning it, but also saying, you know, I was there that day and I tried to watch it and this is how it felt like to me mixing that together with the guys who made it. They're also like embarrassed when it comes out. Spoiler. Yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was just like the doors kept opening for more people. You know, I think one of the last interviews we did was Patton Oswalt. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe, you know what it was? It might've been Steve Sansweet. Hmm. Um, going up to Rancho, we got Steve yeah. in May of 2023. The movie had already played at um, South by Southwest in March of 2023, and so we were right. still adding people. We got Steve Sands, we, we got Gus Lopez, we got Bobcat Goldthwait, we got Patton Oswald, and those all came in after the South by screening. Huh. Um, 
So the, the, the festival version of the documentary, if you, if you got to see that is different than this version, it's just, it's better. You know, we added more to it and took some other stuff out. And, um, but like I said, people kept coming forward wanting to be in it. So, um, it was a very organic research heavy, you know, process. The thing too, getting Kevin Smith, which I love his podcast, his, you know, interview style when he was doing more interviews. Now it's more him and just Mark Bernard jamming together, talking stuff. But the one thing that he always gets flack on social media for is he loved everything, which was funny in the documentary because you could tell he was trying to be like, he's Kevin Smith. He, you could tell like the love of Star Wars shining through the comments that he's making about the holiday special. He's like, yeah, well, it wasn't that bad. Like, blah, blah, blah. like we still got star Wars, like, which I can yeah, imagine. From this, yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine like after 77, like if I was in that moment, I'd be Jones in for any star Wars I could get too. Like, yeah, you didn't, you didn't have action figures or they were just coming that, that Christmas. And you, um, you couldn't really take Star Wars home with you. There was no way to watch it on home video. There was no streaming. You maybe had your pajamas, a board game, yeah. some color forms or something like that. It was Slim Pickens, Burger King cups. But in order to keep Star Wars alive, you had to kind of seek it out. Um, we're very fortunate right now. Whereas you can have Star Wars can be your lifestyle. You have Star Wars clothing. You have Star Wars apparel. You have Star Wars in your kitchen. You have Star Wars toasters. You have Star Wars everything. <laughs> Yeah. You have Star Wars on your Christmas tree. You know, I've got ornaments. I've got Baby Yoda here. You know, it's just like, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's permeated all aspects of our culture. But back then, you didn't. And so when this dropped on the airwaves, and it, like I think it had like 13 million people watching. That's like insane by today's standards. You know, 13 million people is like the biggest show on TV. Um, yeah. And everyone in America was watching it. You know, and then people just never heard about it again and then you're like did i watch that what was that and you know star log would mix up pictures from the cantina versus the holiday special and people would get confused there's the blue snaggletooth red snaggletooth you yeah. know there's a lot of um you know a lot of taboo around it too because lucasfilm didn't want to talk about it and then the internet couldn't stop it you know you you could go on youtube and click click holiday special and you're like oh my god it did exist here it is mm -hmm. you know and that that changed things and before that was was vhs and then after that it was dvds being passed around cd rom so um fans kept this thing alive and now like you said lucasfilm and disney are in a sense leaning into it you know you can go buy the chewbacca red snuggie robes at the mm -hmm. at the park you can go buy the orb you can go buy ornaments you can go buy I just got, you know, the, the vintage three and three quarter inch Chewbacca vintage collection action figure is like the greatest oh, yeah, thing, yeah. best toy of the year. Yeah, he's Why amazing. don't they put out the whole family finally? Why don't, why don't they put out Gormanda and um, Akmina? They should put out a yeah. five pack. That Dude. would sell out. That would sell yeah. out. You could do, I mean, if they wanted to be cheap about it, they could even do like the one Disney store has. It's like yay big and the figures are probably two inches like the rubber set and there's like a dozen rubber characters sure Do it would that. sell out yeah for yeah forget about it. i think like, um hopefully this documentary cements some important star wars history um there's like i said there's a lot that's been speculated about and getting some of these people who actually were there talking yeah. about it on camera and locking it down i think it's a it's an important historical document even though there's a comedic tone to it all um because you don't want this stuff to be forgotten it's easy to to forget what where star wars came from it's mm -hmm. easy you know, now we look at it and you look at the footage of you know tens of thousands of people lining up outside of man's theater and you're like holy crap that's it's incredible like mm -hmm. people don't do that for anything anymore you know uh, and you would wait all day to get in. You know, you that was just, it was a different time. Whereas right now you pre-buy your seat. Is it a recliner? What's the screen? What are the speakers yeah. like? You pre-order your food. It's a totally different way of being a fan. For and sure. it's not better or worse, but there is a, there's a casualness to it and an ease to which you can be a fan right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then it, had, it was a little more, a little more, a little more challenging, you know, and, and, Star Wars was a little different.
And that's what we're trying to show. Like, it's easy to look at this now from the lens of 2023 and all the stuff you have at your fingertips and Andor and you can stream everything. And then like, what do I watch? You know, you have infinite choices. And you can look at this and like, this is horrible. But in the context of like 1978, this was everything if you were a Star Wars fan. Like you had to be in front of that set, but on the ground, everyone quiet. You know, you're watching this two hours and it must have been soul crushing, you know, because it's not Star Wars, the sequel. <laughs> the the thing, too, which is uh, the way that you guys break it down is perfect because you can like if you didn't have an hour and a half, because that's one thing people freaking now being a high school teacher, like the attention span is is so short. So if you wanted to, you could really break this documentary down into episodes because you guys break it into segments just the way that the the it show has breaking works. points yeah you could you're right um yeah. and you're right tension span is completely completely changed the way content's made yeah and so with that i love the fact because i was trying to to get my parents to remember this telling them that i was going to get to talk to you and we were sitting there laughing about the opening sequence of the special is that like you know 10, 10 minutes however long it is of meeting chewy's family with no subtitles watching this oh, thing. yeah so we watched this thing i want to say it was like a year ago and we did it it was oh, a, boy. it was a charity live stream so we tweeted here's the link on youtube we are watching and then we did a live stream like this of us watching it with the charity we were supporting like ticker at the bottom and we were nobody I had I was doing this with had ever seen it before. And the first 10 minutes hit, and probably 90 seconds to two minutes in, the questions start rolling in, like, wait a minute, like <laughs> there's there's no subtitles. Like, I get Chewy doesn't have subtitles, but is this what this is? Like, how long does this go on for? And then on the documentary, the guy, I can't remember who it was, but whoever it was saying, Yeah. You know, the TV execs figured Americans aren't going to read subtitles, so screw it. We're throwing it in with no subtitles. Yeah. Like, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> and Kevin's just like, yeah, they're just going to chew it the whole time. And, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it's it's pretty bold. You know, it's, it's a very George Lucas thing, though, to do that, to be like, like oh, you said, that's what I want to do. Million people, damn right, it's bold. <laughs> 13 million people watching like nine and a half minutes of just Wookiees grunting. <laughs> like that's pretty is, incredible. That is pretty, yeah, without question. Like that is awesome. Um, yeah. The, the fact too that you guys have the like the rumored story of George apparently laughing about making the story about the Wookiee family. At some point, like, which I can just like that just as you guys are telling that story in the doc, every like sketch comedy, George Lucas, who does a George impression, like what I'm going to look at this. <laughs> like, it's, yeah, it's perfect, man. Like, and I'm so glad you enjoyed it. I mean, that, that's <laughs> we we made it for for fans, you know, and a lot of people, even if you're a huge Star Wars fan, a lot of people have not seen the special. And I would say you watch this first. If you haven't seen the special yet, you've waited this long, watch this first, and then I think you watch the special, and you'll at least be able to get through it. It's really hard to get through, but this will give you some understanding, and it'll give you some guidance, and then um, context. You know, that's really the key. I, I, I would definitely recommend starting with the the doc and then the special. It'll definitely help you understand what the hell it is that's going on. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But man, with with you, I gotta ask you a couple questions about fanboys. Sure. Just as a okay. fan of fanboys. When you're yeah. when you guys are making that film, because that was I mean, that was kind of like the running thing I can remember, even at the junior high school level, is like someone has to be able to figure out what this movie is going to be about. When we heard, especially when like the name The Phantom Menace, like, whoa, the Phantom, like, what's gonna happen? And so that yeah. was such the hot topic. So making this movie about getting the break in and steal the script had to have been a blast. It was a dream come true. 
couldn't do that. It was it was completely awesome. You know, it was a thrill ride, and it was not without its challenges, challenges and setbacks, because uh, you're still making it with a film studio. And at a certain point, they're like, "All right, all right, you get you gave us what you promised, but like, why do we make fun of fans? There's more people that are not fans than fans. We can make fun of them, and you know, and they wanted to change the crawl to be." you know, fanboys, you know, um, mm. define it like dictionary. Like it's a term for men who can't get laid. They have all these horrible mm. things they want to do. To, I'm like, you're going to offend our core audience from the very first second of the film. Yeah. They didn't care. You know, so they tinkered with all these things. And ultimately, thankfully, they came back to their senses and let's make more or less the movie we wanted to make. It's all about heart. Yeah. It's not really about Star Wars. It's about friendship. And so... We made great memories making it. All the actors involved, everybody involved, writers, producers, everyone still talks. Everyone would love to do more. You know, yeah. the rights have been passed around all these different places. I think we figured out where it is now, but it's it'd be a challenge to do more, but we still have the desire to do it. Um, but yeah, it was magical. It was one of those things where you're like, you know, such a special experience. And getting to make like both... Uh fictional feature and then now a documentary seeing both the real you know with documentary and then getting to create like your own narrative with fanboys and stuff what would you say like some of the coolest like bts like looks at star wars or like cool like stuff that like normal people don't get to see that you you got to saw was there anything like that that you got to scope out there's, a, there's always a lot along the way. Um, you know, it's just more just the, you know, the experience of things. Like when I met the people at Lucasfilm and they let me shoot up there and they kind of backed the project, it was still a uh, you know, privately owned company. George was still the figurehead and, and there was this really creative culture around it all. You know, And it felt like this com- creative enclave that he dreamed up. And you were at this place that was like paradise up outside of San Francisco. And it was like, that was the, that I was like that's hard to convey to people what you're seeing what you're experiencing but he created this haven for all these creatives to come up and work on their movies and finish their movies and that was it was a dream for me to like see that you know as a as a filmmaker studying film to get to go to the place where this guy dreamed up he's basically like the ultimate dream of an independent filmmaker the ultimate success he's made all these movies independently has all this money he reinvests it into the development of the medium sound editing visual effects he puts it back into education and this guy like he manifested it you know he's curious on six thousand acres with this this paradise of a post-production facility and you know and there i am doing it as a little boy I dreamed of that so i was like this is this is incredible and then it's sad when you see people just make fun of him and they criticize him and you're yeah. like hold on a second this guy made these are like the best independent movies ever made he doesn't have to listen to anyone he's spending 130 million a movie to make his movie and he doesn't who cares? honestly who are you like to criticize yeah. his movie like this is the guy who brainchilded all this he, if he wants to tell this story then great you know i would have made anakin a little older in the first one use the same actor through all three like but it's george he's he did his own thing you know yeah. you can't fault him for that he spent his own money he put his money where his mouth was and he made these independent films um and along the way just changed the business you know it's pretty impressive so getting to see a glimpse of that getting to meet him <laughs> um getting him to have my back on the film, uh, support me versus the Weinstein company. That was all insane uh, and cool. This, you know, this was another type of experience because we're outside the gates of Lucasfilm making this thing and looking at it, um, telling the stories of the people who worked on it. You know, they don't, they don't own the story of the people who worked on it. These people have their own tale of things. They were, they're paid artists to come and create it and they made a, a they happened to contribute to a slice of Lucasfilm's history. And so it felt like it needed to be cataloged and documented and curated. Um, and I think that the documentary really curates the special well. So if you've mm-hmm. never watched the special, this is probably your best way to experience it. Maybe hopefully annually, hopefully every Christmas time, every life day, people pop this on and they watch this because sure. the special isn't that satisfying. <laughs> um, so that was just another, you know, another I, I think just committing to it, saying we're going to tell the story, we're going to go make yeah. this film, and getting everyone we could in front of the camera, that was, 
you're, I was learning about it as we're making it because no one knew all this stuff. Nobody, nobody was an expert. There's nobody on earth that was an expert of this stuff. The way uh, this documentary ends up being the expert voice and aggregating all these voices that have never been collected before all these clips. You can go watch some of these clips on YouTube, but no one's ever curated them in this way and, and told it in this uh, chronological way with, with context. So that was like, again, felt, we felt honored that we were doing this. Like we had to do it because otherwise it'd be lost to history. You guys did a really good job of conveying the, putting the viewer, like you were there then feeling too, because there's some documentaries you watch and it's all a uh, confessional style interview clip with intersliced with either like a recreation or. Oh God. Yeah. Recreation. Or, I, yeah, you guys, you guys adding actual clips of like Mark and Carrie and Harrison and George, even like talking about it, either be like convention panel or like interview snippets or uh, to yeah, like, Peter Mayhew. You know, he's proud of yeah. it. You know, like anytime we could find these people talking about it, we tried to sift through it and keep them alive in it you know obviously some of them are not alive and we can't sit with them and then once it felt it felt imbalanced to interview some and not the others and we knew some weren't going to talk about it um so it felt like we just needed to keep it all um keep it all separate you know like Mm -hmm. there's the journalists and there's the people that worked on it and then there's the cast that were in it and those are almost secondhand uh, interviews and things like that Mm -hmm. um yeah that was it was definitely a a challenge i think um on one hand there's so much stuff to sift through you know and then it becomes obvious that like okay this is the story though it's really speaking to you and i think that's what jeremy did a good job of distilling it down keeping it simple keeping it constantly moving forward and keeping it fun like -hmm. you get just enough of each thing just enough of mark and and Harrison to know how they feel about it. Just enough of Anthony Daniels. Mm -hmm. Um, And then trying to, there's no recreations. You know, so many docs these days are about murder, corporate, espionage, overdosing. Someone's got a double life and they've gone to prison or someone's a child molest. It's all these horrible subject matters. And that's what people want to watch, you know, crime. I'm not interested really. Yeah. In, in that, you know what I mean? It's heavy. It's not fun. And then they spend half their, half the production is just recreations. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll just make the movie at that point. You know, why am I watching the doc? Either tell the story with archival and faces or go make a narrative feature. Like don't do both, you know? Sure. And we definitely didn't want to do any recreations. Uh, we didn't also have the money to do any recreations. It was just like, let's just get the camera on these people and let them tell their true self uh, yeah. to us. And they felt very disarmed and they could open up and be honest, you know, so you could, what do they have to lose? You know, they're telling about Bob Mackey talking about why he's picking colors and designing these costumes and these leotards and stuff. It was great to just see him recollect and take you all back through it. Like he was pitching it to you and you were there in 1978, you know, Um, I thought that stuff was cool. Yeah. That's super cool. The, the fact too, that you guys were able to, compile enough information to kind of like describe what they were thinking as to why they made the decisions that they did. I thought it was interesting that like a lot of the celebrities wanted to have their spotlight song, like the whole, uh, you know, B Arthur story. I was like, Holy smokes. Like that's pretty wild. Yes. (laughs) Uh, That that B Arthur story. I, I like hearing like the way B Arthur also would talk about, um, working with her co-stars and Need of Heart yeah. and uh, Corman and stuff, they're like, um, they were. He was like, I don't even want to remember it. I don't. I don't know what it was. It was so weird. You know, he he had this like traumatic experience with it. Um, it, it was just like all these. It was these old timers, but then you know they're pros too, and they're like, sure, I'll show up. I'll do. I'll do your Star Wars, you know. And then like yeah. they all, you know, had this way of talking about, it. and then they all were like strangely everyone would come up to me for the rest of my life and ask me about this special you know yeah. it's so bad why are people remembering it? the director too was like people still ask me about the star wars special you know um i think that's i mean it's down to fans 
down to like the Star Wars power of fandom that people remember this thing and still talk about it. That's why it's back at parks. That's why there's action figures and Snuggies and all this stuff is because fans didn't let it die. And then Lucasfilm sees that and it's like, okay, there's something, there's magic here. Yeah, there's definitely like the Star Wars definitely have like these like appreciation, different types of appreciations of all the different Star Wars things. Like you have your like traditionalists that it's only Han, Luke and Leia, bro. Like get out of here, extended universe. Then you have the like we love everything. Like if it's Star Wars, like we try to love it as much as we can. And then you have like then you have like the ones that love to call stuff like the cult classics like i mean remember god like defending solo every day for the longest time when that movie came out and now it's like taken on this role of like it's cool to like solo because people shit all over it for so long i feel like yeah that, i feel like that's where the holiday special has evolved like it was this thing that came out in the moment you're loving it because it was star wars then it went through this period of just everyone just talking trash about it for the longest time. And yeah. it's and it's circled all the way back to where it's like this cult classic infamy. And I totally double down on your statement of don't watch it, just watch the documentary, because you guys convey everything that's in that thing in 30 less minutes with no commercial breaks. And you can follow exactly what the hell is going on the whole time. That was the yeah. Christmas special. And you get inside scoops from the guys that made it. And you get like interviews with a bunch of dope people like Pat and Oswald, like you said, and Weird Al and stuff. So like it's the best. Yeah, like the stuff with Donny Osmond, the stuff with Dude, the, yeah, Pierce Donny from Osmond. Jefferson Starship. is like Jeff, I, Jeff from Jefferson Starship being there. And he's like, I just trusted Lucasfilm knew what they were doing, you know? I laughed out loud when they play clips from the Osmonds. Like that was holy. Chris stuff. Christopherson clip. Yeah. Is like <laughs> you forget. I hadn't seen that stuff. I saw it on you know YouTube years ago. And I was like, you watch it again. You're like, oh my God. Like <laughs> what was happening back then? Like yeah. television in general was just wacky. You know, this is yeah. a, there's something bonkers about this. And like what we're proud of is the documentary isn't mean. We're not sitting around taking like low blows at the special. It's easy to say, oh, this is horrible. And right. Of course, there's a million things produced better than it. But um, we try to be affectionate and positive. And yeah, we poke fun, but it's not like mean and savage in any way. It's like, Don't and then we do it within the context of knowing, okay, they had no money left. They have to dress up these Wookiees and Snuggies. They had to light it with candles, you know, like they're out of money and they're just, and you go, oh, okay, I see. Now, now in that light, I understand what that was. And sure, they're up again. They're just trying to get something on film. You know, they don't, they don't know what they're doing. They're just winging it, you know, the, so you have empathy for these people. Every, like all the razzing towards the holiday special by everyone in the documentary, you can tell just by looking at their face when they're saying what they say is done with like a affection. Like they love it. I'm glad you felt that. Okay. That's like, what we, I felt like these were also good, good people that could make fun of something, but still show affection and be positive. And that's who we wanted to like bring in to, to comment on it. Um, yeah. And I don't want people to leave this and think we're trying to like criticize it, the people who made it people who made it or like George specifically, because look, he, he, his role was marginal at best and he couldn't stop it he wanted to stop it it and it, it's coming out people spent money on it. there's not much he could do but he did learn from it you know and i think that's that's an important way of looking at it in terms of lucas is like he then didn't let people go play with star wars like what happened between 1983 and 1999 yeah did he no. go let other people go make movies did he sell it to a studio no yeah. he's like if, if anyone's gonna make star wars it's gonna be me and i'm taking a break and he went and told other stories and did other things and raised a family. And then he started to dabble back into it. He teased the movies. He put some books and comic books out. He got like Star Wars alive again in the zeitgeist. Kind of like what he did precursor to A New Hope coming out. Like they did these things to activate it with fans. And Star Wars could have become just a, just a legendary cult film. You know, if he didn't put out special editions and we could just be looking at it like it's like a Big Trouble in Little China or something. But mm -hmm. instead it's a cultural behemoth you know it's like it's the biggest the biggest ip you know out there for the longest time 
Um, it should be the biggest IP, even if it's not right now. Um, and he was very smart and patient, but he learned a lesson from the holiday special, which is I'm not going to let other people go do this. Um, yeah. It's going to happen. I'm going to be there. I want to make sure it's good. And he did that slow build himself with the special editions and, and the prequels. And he directed them all himself. And, you know, he didn't really let anyone else come play in that sandbox that could ruin it, you know? So mm -hmm. I think there's those lessons learned from, from this experience that changed the course of star Wars. I think too, that his journey, you know, and you've, you've hit on it a lot. Like he, he self finances his stuff. Like he built Lucasfilm literally from the ground up. Like, the dude is is really like what it is to be like a true filmmaker entrepreneur like make my own world and like you're all gonna want to live in it like it is wild to think that that came that started with one dude we actually live in his hometown and he made an appearance for graffiti weekend like 10 years ago and if the only thing wow. that I can compare it to is like how Catholics compare Jesus on Palm Sunday. Like it was. Wait, where do you live? Where are you Mod based? Modesto. You're in Modesto? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I don't teach at the high school he went to, but I know the high school he went to still has like a, a display, like, you know, peace thing, homage to him. And, um, Going to film, I went to film school at LA Film School, but I'm nice. here. And so being a filmmaker here and kind of like finding other Northern California filmmakers and collaborating up here in here, it's like the the, the energy that the, our group kind of carries is like being a, trying to be a professional wrestler when you're from the same town as Bret Hart. Like, it's like. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, like the vibe is very cool. Like it's not a, you know, I've got, feel like we got friends lucky enough to know people like across the country. And the, you know, sadly, like my friends, like in the middle of the country, that support system there is pretty hard to find. And yeah. whereas, whereas here, it's, it's very strong, which is a fortunate thing. It's a cool thing. How often does he come back? Barely. Like, barely. Um, I wish because the whole like graffiti thing is a total like American graffiti celebration. So yeah, I like he's got the vibe like if he was gonna do something, he would it would be that it wouldn't be like a they do like a Star Wars weekend thing downtown. I don't see him appearing necessarily at that. Whereas the graffiti thing, he just rode in a cruiser and was waving to people. This is right around the time where he uh, got remarried, and so. Oh, yeah. He's, I mean, that's a great movie. That's one of my favorites, too. Yeah, yeah. Everything he did is really ahead of its time. So it's hard yeah. for anybody to live in the, the, the shadow of that. You know, he's one of the most important people of the last century. You know, he's one of the most important creatives and one of the most important people in film history. Um, so you compare anybody to him, it's kind of it's kind of bonkers. Yeah. He doesn't get the I don't know if people realize the amount of techie stuff that he did, has done. It's because I don't, the shine from like a casual movie fan, like I think they just associate yeah. you know, on Luke Leia. Like they don't associate necessarily like Industrial Light and Magic and THX and like this and that and every post production thing the dude has advanced. It's like Pixar really. Pixar found it up with him, you know, like right. linear editing up. You know, I think there's a selfishness to people and audiences. People right now want everything curated and right to them. They want it to like hit them specifically. Everything's niche. And and they wanted the Star Wars films and shows to evolve to exactly in exactly the pace they did. So I'm at this point in my life. Why isn't my Star Wars right here for me? Yeah. You know, and what he did with the prequels was went and told a story that he was like, you know what? Like I'm going to tell a story for kids, kids and adults. You know, I'm not making the movie for everyone who grew up with Star Wars. That's 25 now, you know, or 30. I'm making Star Wars stories for a new generation. And he approached it in that same type of boyish wonder way. I think, you know, people bring a lot of anger to that conversation with the prequels, which is unfortunate. And then they, they lose sight of what he really did. It was good. And 
even Return of the Jedi gets maligned. And you look at that film, and that's an independent film. And he took the greatest villain of all time, Darth Vader, cinema's greatest villain up to that point. He didn't have to go humanize him at the end yeah. and tell a story where he takes his, his helmet off and he has this bonding moment with his son and you cry. Like my, my eight-year-old was in the car the other day and he's like, he was talking about how yeah, he got sad when he so he remembered when he was like three and he saw Return of the Jedi. He's like, I got really sad. That made me sad when Darth Vader died. And, and I'm just thinking about, you know, that that's like cinema's greatest villain. And here he took a risk and did that. And then, and to do that, you then have to create an even scarier villain. And he delivered on the emperor, you know, but everyone's just like, oh, there's dummy walks. You know, they don't look at the incredible risky things he did do in that, you know, it's his own money. And he's like, well, I'm going to go humanize the world's greatest villain. And I'm going to create a bigger villain. And, you know, I'm going to triple down on the VFX and yeah. I'm going to triple the budget. And like, he's not playing it safe. He's always pushing the boundaries and even the prequels, you know, it was like, more models in Phantom Menace than any movie in history. He shot the second movie completely digital. He was doing reshoots for Phantom Menace, using digital cameras to test them for the next movie. He's always moving, thinking about the next thing. Yeah. Um, and he never gets credit for that. All he does are people just want to criticize him. And like, there was no Han Solo in, in the prequels. You're like, well, why would there be? The Emperor and the Empire hadn't taken over. Why would you need a cynical character if there's nothing to be cynical about, you know, like, so there's a logic to that. Like, well, the ships are all shiny. Well, no crap. They're shiny because it's been a thousand years of peace. So yeah. why would there be anything other than Chrome and yellow? Like the reason they look like Han Solo ship is because they're jury rigged and they've seen combat and blah, blah, blah. There's a, in George's mind, there's a logic, you know, maybe he doesn't always convey it perfectly, but if you really study it, there's a pretty brilliant logic to it. And then he goes and he spends the money to make his story the way he wants to. It's his mm -hmm. toys, you know, and he created some incredible toys that the rest of the world then gets to play with. You never want to make fun of them. It's crazy. The, the prequels too. not enough people, I think, see it as like this three act total psychological mind game <clears throat> that's being played, you know, by Palpatine. Yeah. And, and he's not know, even using the force. You know, a lot no. of it's not using the dark side. He's just being a politician right under their nose. <clears throat> right. He's just yeah. he's just him. And so yeah. it's, it's creepy, man. Like when you go back and like really watch that movie. And I have little problems with all the movies, you know. But, <clears throat> but I think overall, you know, I look at the prequels in a very fond way. And especially Fanboys was very fused with Phantom Menace and that whole time period for me was was special so i look at them warmly i know other people don't and even the sequels for the most part i i i love ray i love kylo ren i love the cast i love i love bba i love all these there's really great characters really great cast like kylo ren if you think about it, he's a pretty brilliant idea for character you know darth vader was this faceless villain the face of like corporation you know Who's right. this person? It's faceless darkness. Kylo Ren is like the trench coat mafia unsettled teen who would sure. go shoot a movie theater up. He's just angry and volatile. And that, that's actually what was scary back then in 2014 when they were developing this movie. Yep. It was like um, selfish character that thought they should, they, they owned, their legacy was theirs, you know, and it should be theirs and they have too much power and no responsibility for it. And so there were some really cool things they were playing with in there. Um, I'm not a Last Jedi fan, um, but I do enjoy the the this, the whole time I've had with Star Wars over the past, you know, since 2015. Yeah. And for the most part, I've enjoyed the shows. I love the animation. You know, so there's always something that keeps me hopeful in coming back to Star Wars. The thing, too, about the sequels that was cool, uh, the character was so different, Kylo Ren, that it yeah. became this talking point. And that, that trilogy came out at a, a rough time. Um, my dad was getting ready to retire, and I think that was having kind of an effect on him. And it was really like I was working for him at the time. And the stress of that, and like trying to like work and relationship, like it wasn't yeah. happening. And 
to convey to him how like he was making like making it feel that like, yeah the scenes between Kylo Ren and Han Solo. I'm like, if you look at how he feels, this is how, like, when you are in just full work mode, like, this is how it is, like, trying to, like, make you feel like anything outside of work. And he, like, he instantly, like, got it. And it was, it not only did he get it, but it, like, created this whole new relationship with Star Wars, he and I, that great. We, we had always watched them together and anything but it'd be like he started reading the books and it was like i had always been still am like a bigger believer you know people call me nerd or they completely get it and they're like damn that's really deep but the whole mythology of star wars is very much like tied into you know multiple religions and you can definitely draw parallel like a lot more parallels than people would love to like give credit to because of the name Star Wars. They instantly say, "Oh, that dorky, you know, franchise." But like, yeah. there's there's a ton of parallels there. And oh yeah, they want to strip it of all its seriousness and all its merit because they just think it's childish. Right. And there's that's why it's endured. You have to look at it on a cultural level and say, "Why though has this thing endured for this many years? Why is it at the pinnacle of pop culture? Why are kids so fascinated to play with it? Why is everyone so fascinated to live in this universe?" And it's not just because of special effects, but he's tapping into something spiritually. And also, there's a hopefulness to it. And it's underpinned by all these familiar things. It's amalgamation of all these genres of things that that Western and, and science fiction and fantasy and samurai and screwball comedy. And, and it all like coalesces into something completely new. And you have to... You can do a serious study on it, you know? And yes, like uh, on the surface level, it is like forward facing all audience, you know, four year olds, sure, four year olds can watch it. And so can 80 year olds. Um, and there's people that want to, you know, I went to film school and too. And, and at film school, everyone didn't want to take, you know, be like, what's your favorite movie? Like Star Wars. And I was like, you yeah. Know? And they'd be yeah. like, oh, I love Louis Bunuel. And you're like, okay, great. I like him too. But guess what? You know, like there's something fascinating about, Star Wars now it changed the medium that we're studying. So, you know, why are you are you crapping on it? Right. Um I, I love foreign films. I love samurai films. I love Japanese cinema and French New Air. I like it all, you know, but yeah, like and I have different types of favorite films. But you're right, if people don't want to take it seriously. And part of it is Star Wars' own fault, because there's been elements of Star Wars where Star Wars doesn't take itself seriously. Sure. You know? Sure. And um it reduces itself to product. And I do wish and hope that in the future, Star Wars, as it moves forward with new content and stuff, remembers that the brand should always be synonymous with innovation, technological and cinematic innovation. George is always pushing boundaries. It's not just like, you know, other, other movies can do what you see in a Star Wars movie. Star Wars used to always be, oh my God, you have to see it. It's the greatest spectacle. It's like a three ring circus. You have to go see the Star Wars film because the effects are next level. Mm -hmm. And it was always effects tied to myth and and important folklore and narrative. Like it's it's the greatest, the Luke's the original trilogy is like the greatest hero's journey in film. You know, I don't you can't think of a better one. Three films, there's nothing that yeah. encapsulates that. Um it borrows from all those, you know, great traditions, the Greek myths and all the stuff that play in these things. So there's so many ways to analyze it and slice it and study it. And then there's the people that just want to reduce it to, you know, it's child fare, you know, and that's, that's unfortunate. And then you're like, you know what? I don't, I really, I don't need to talk to you. You know, you're, yeah, you, live yeah. in a, you live in a shell, like go back to your echo chamber <laughs> and, you know, I don't, I, it's not a healthy discourse. So, and I'm critical of Last Jedi, and I do it in a very healthy way, you know. And yeah. um, and it's not just to say, oh, it's bad, but I want to look at why it doesn't work, you know. And mm -hmm. then there's some really intrinsic things that are bump up against the DNA of Star Wars, mostly hope, you know. The concept of George is like these things are supposed to be hopeful. Um, so there's, you know, and as long as you approach it and you approach your fandom, I think, with, with passion you bring yourself to it and you're going to talk about it in like a non-combative antagonistic way then you know you can learn a lot about life from star wars 
there's so much spiritual stuff in you in it and so many lessons about the industry and, and it's been around for so long that you've watched the industry evolve because of it and yeah. around it and past it and then trying to emulate it and on a business sense you learn there's different so many different ways to study star wars yeah for sure and they all like you you hit it on the head is move forward or push the boundary or hopefully continue to and i heard you on the john campia show the other day and it sounds like you uh you know as far as moving forward i've got some cool stuff coming up do you, what what do you got coming up i am at work now in post production i co-directed the documentary on the history of dungeons and dragons That's so cool. that'll be out for the 20 for the 50th anniversary in 2024 and um developing some new tv shows some unscripted shows some scripted fantasy stuff there's a little bit of of everything on the horizon right. uh there's a lot more in the book space coming uh, i've been doing some books with dungeons and dragons like dungeon dragons history books dungeon dragons cookbooks mm -hmm. they turned our DD show uh cookbook into a DD cooking show so that's out now four episodes in on freebie and plex and I'm in all 20 episodes, which is cool. So I get to talk D and D lore as people are cooking through the recipes from our book. So it's kind of surreal. So that's you know, un, we're going to be um, you know, rolling out those episodes throughout the next month or so, right. and um, you know, trying to do a little bit of everything. If it's something that taps into passion or interest, I'm going to follow it. You know, I feel like that's what I've been trying to do from fanboys through this. It's if it's um. If I can bring myself into it and make it a little personal, then it's interesting, you know? Um, and if it's stuff that meant something to me as a kid or as an adult, of course I want to be in, involved in it. So if it's Star Wars, yeah, I'm in, I'm in, you know? So when Jeremy approached me with this and said, hey, we're doing a doc on the Star Wars holiday special, I was just like, I'm in. You know, I didn't need to, I didn't need to hear more. Right on, man. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Where can everybody keep track of you? See, you know, when you do have the new stuff that hits, hits streaming or hits theaters. Yes. So um, Kyle underscore Newman at Twitter, Kyle underscore Newman at Instagram. Um, I have a fan page on Facebook, Kyle Newman fan page. You can find me there. And I'll be posting, you know, a lot of information about, you know, the doc as it unfolds um we're doing really well right now i think you know we're the second most popular movie on rotten tomatoes right now in the streaming space we're gonna have streaming oh, yeah. details coming out so this movie will be out next year on a streaming service um right. and you know it's just as things unfold you know i'll be popping the info up there and i'd love to hear what people think if you do watch the special write to me let me know i'd love to know how you felt about it, what you thought about it. Um, yeah, I do like to engage with people if they're um, if they're taking the time to watch something I made. Sure, send a message. I'll write back. And um, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, I promise fun. It's nothing but fun. You got to check it out. If you're listening to this podcast, then you probably will love it. Yeah. Um, and we made it for like no money. So spread the word. It's a true independent film. This isn't like a big corporation making this thing. It's just four friends barely made this thing, you know, because we love Star Wars and that's it, you know? Um, and so we just want to get the word out about it. So thank you for having me on. No problem, man. We will definitely uh, look forward to doing this, uh, hopefully down the line as more and more of your stuff comes out. It was cool. awesome. Thank you.